Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Popsicle, a sweet new show where a guest and I lap up what's new in pop culture. My name is RJ from RJ's Food Rocks, and today we have back our literary queen and co-host of the Harry Potter and the Anxious Millennials podcast. It's Allie. Welcome back, Allie. I can't believe it's already another time, another book episode. I, I know that your fans were begging for my return so everyone can stop asking i'm here <laughs> i'm here ali were you silent or were you silenced by me <laughs> i you know what i was silent Okay, today on The Popsicle, we will be unwrapping the debut novel by author Lowen Lee. It's a fa love story. Here is my copy, my beautiful copy. Um, we decided today to kind of dress up. So I am dressed up kind of like how Bao is dressed up, one of the main characters. He likes to wear his plaid because he's a teenage boy and I'm wearing an apron because he works in his restaurant and they all, the descriptions of his hair, I tried to do it as, as much as I could make it look like soft and gorgeous. I did some dry shampoo cause I didn't want to get it wet, but this is my look for today. <laughs> what about you, Allie? Um, I decided that I would do something to honor my family. So I wore this fantastic Hawaiian shirt um, that my dad gave me. Um, my brother has actually, I actually took it from my brother. <laughs> my dad gave it to my brother and I took it from my brother. Um, but I have a really great picture of my dad in the 80s skateboarding while wearing this shirt. So, and I also have one of my grandmother's gorgeous chains. She, she was rich in chains and I benefited from it. Uh, so yes, today on the Popsicle, we will be discussing our uh, second book of the series, A Fall Love Story. Here's your Too Cold Didn't Eat TCDE, a funny, smart, romantic comedy of two Vietnamese American teens who fall in love and must navigate their newfound relationship amid, amidst, amid, amidst. You got it. Amidst. Thank you. Amidst their family's age old feud about their competing neighboring restaurants. So for years, the Mai's and the Nguyen's have been at odds, having owned competing neighboring pho restaurants. Bao and Lin, who've avoided each other for most of their lives, both suspect that the feud stems from feelings much deeper than the competition of the restaurants. Um, but then a chance encounter brings Lin and Bao in the same vicinity despite their best efforts and sparks fly, leading them to both wonder what took so long for them to connect. Uh, but then, of course, they immediately remember <laughs> it's because of their families. <laughs> so can Lin and Bao find love in the midst of feuding families and complicated histories? Um, this was my first time reading a, like a young adult rom-com novel. So I was very excited um, to get into it. And um, I actually found this book through like a Twitter recommendation, um, just like promoting you know, upcoming Asian American works. And I'm very excited that we get to read a debut novel. That's very exciting. Um, when I started, when I started reading it, I didn't realize that it was young adult. Like I thought it was just a regular adult book. And so I was like, oh, this is different than I thought, but it was fun. And I was happy. But it was just a fun little surprise. In our show, we talk about what we like about the piece of pop culture that we uh, consumed. The sweet. So let's talk about the sweet. I really like this book because I felt like I could feel and smell the settings. I could feel what it was like to be in a restaurant constantly. Growing up, my parents had like a restaurant in like a mall, like a food, like a, you know, like in the, uh, uh, the food court. So growing up, I, I never was like forced to like help out, but I was always there. Um, like after school, I would go in and like help scoop rice on plates and like just like sit there and wait until we were done. Um, but I always like it can't kind of get what I was transported back to the like being in a kitchen and smelling food literally every day. Um, I'm curious to know what you uh, felt about the setting because you famously don't eat food. <laughs> don't like food. So this is just, it's just such a stupid thing about me. I've just never been a person that like has passion for food. I just don't, I know so many people who love food and to me, it's just like a means to an end. So I'm sorry about that. I know that I, when I say that people react very strongly, um, but I actually really liked it. I think um, 
part of it was just this idea that like I am very much this is so I'm just a white person like I don't really have culture like I don't have you know like a family background and and so it's like I don't really have like quote unquote culture in this way and so I actually really enjoyed and really valued kind of feeling like I was being brought into this world and being exposed to not only like the restaurant life, but the the home life and the neighborhood and kind of the, like the street the restaurant was on. Um, and so I, I, in that sense, I really enjoyed it. The lived in experiences of the two families is really interesting, especially like looking at it from the eyes of the two teenagers, because they are first, they're first generation. They were born and raised in America, but their, uh, their families were essentially like refugees, um, immigrants um, from Vietnam. But so there were so many small kind of like touchstones of their just like normal daily life that I was like, oh, this is resonating. Like technically I'm an immigrant because my family and I moved here um, when I was little. Well, not even little. It was like, I was like 13. But there were just so many things that like um, I was like connected with immediately to kind of like talk about that first generation versus immigrant experience and how like first generation is truly like you are skirting the the world between this new place that I am in and like traditions and expectations for me in this new place like America where I'm like I have to do what I want land of the free like you know be able to do what I want but then like taking in like the the first the the immigrant story of like I am still definitely a part of where I came from so like there were so many small things like pulling the gray hairs I remember like that was a scene in the book that uh Bao had to pull his mom's gray hairs and I I remember my mom making me do that like when she would get home and lay down and be like can you just hear some tweezers just go ahead and just pluck away um to even the like conversations that they would have of like uh you know, we want you to have a good career. We want you to, uh, you know, have like a good job because that's what we had to do. So you have to do that too. And there's a lot of like, do they really, or are they actually able to, you know, do whatever they want and be whoever they want because that's why they're in America. So I very much appreciated that. I think one of the other things that I really enjoyed about it um, was that there wasn't a real identity crisis that any of the characters were going through in terms of I think it was just very much like it wasn't how do we fit in America it was we are America like you know this is our home this is we're very much a fabric of the society here and like we don't need to doubt that we don't need to figure out how to assimilate like this is our home and this is what we do and I I just I really enjoyed that it it was and obviously like there was the asshole Oh, sorry. I can't swear. The jerk who went into <laughs> the restaurant and that whole interaction. And then, of course, the letter that Bao wrote for the newspaper. But it wasn't like this underlying current of like, who are we in the grand scheme of things? And I, I just enjoyed that that was just kind of like, we're past that. We're moving on, you know. Yeah, I always think that that's in, like an interesting part of like immigrant culture is that we do take ownership of spaces and it's like, this is our neighborhood. This is like, and like, you know, it stemmed back from even like back in the, you know, way back when the Irish immigrated and when like Europeans immigrated. And I think like, I, I that's what I really liked about this was that, yeah, you are so in that world that when when these experiences happen of like, you know, xenophobic or like, you know, people who are like, I, who I don't understand or don't even want to understand the culture, then it is like, yeah, like just leave, <laughs> you know, like I do, I do agree that there, there wasn't any like question about that, that they were just like, we are very much Vietnamese. We we're very much proud of who we are. So it's like, either you want to appreciate what we're trying to do, or you can just like, you know, mind your own business. So that was very nice. Um, and like felt a lot of like strength from the parents, which I really appreciated. I, yeah, I just, I loved, I loved the parents. I loved seeing, um, and I loved seeing kind of the differences between how Lynn acted with her parents and how Bao acted with his parents. And, um, also just to me, like 
the different dynamics at play with Lynn having a sibling and Bao being an only child and exploring that and and Lynn having her aunt come over from Vietnam, having having family that were still in Vietnam. Um, and also I think just the other part that I really um, – that I thought was really meaningful was the exploration of – um, Lynn and Bao wanting to learn more about their parents' stories and what it was like both in Vietnam and what it was like to make it to America and kind of the experience of having to um, work with their parents to get them to share that and be like, no, I, you know, I know it was difficult, but I want to know more about you. It's valuable for me to to know this part of your life and your history. And so I I really enjoyed that exploration. Yeah, I think that like part of that also goes into there is that conflict of the general now it's like the generational aspect of it, right? So it's like the ad- because they kept bringing it up like that's adult talk. This is adults, you know, you don't have to worry about that. You're you'll always be kids even if you are like 18 and you're driving around California. Like there are certain things that you still like you don't have to worry about because I think what their point is that you don't have to. You didn't have to struggle the way we did. So don't even think about it. Just keep going. But then there's still like, from the other point of view, it's like, but you're still acting in a way that we do need to understand because I'm, I'm ended up, I'm ending up being like, ha- not hateful, but like there's parts that I don't trust because then I don't understand why you're, you're make you're doing these things that, um, I feel like can be easily solved if I just knew what was going on, which I do think like that ended up being Lynn's kind of like personal story and conflict that what really um, offended her parents was that she lied to her, that she lied to them about all the things that she was doing from, you know, really standing up for her own self, like with her painting and like actually doing work and like the projects that she was involved in. Um, The entire time I was just like, just, talk just talk to each other as a person who never talks to my parents or like my parents will never do what they did in this book and i think i don't think that we can have a full conversation about the suite without mentioning chef way i loved him i thought he was such a fun character and such just like a light part of of the plot you know what i'm saying because there were so many heavy things going on that it was nice to just have this character that was like fun and like boundless energy and could relate to the main characters, but was also there to just like mentor them. And I, I don't know. I just, I love, I I love any mentor relationship and I love, you Mm -hmm. know, when people it's like, you know, they take someone under their wing. So anytime that that happens in a book, I'm like, Oh, my heart. But I just, he was so fun and in his back and forth with his wife was adorable. So I think what's good about Chef Lei is that he is the epitome of what Bao and Lin ultimately want to happen, right? Like he, from their eyes, Chef Lei is living the life of like, look, he is comfortably in the middle of the two worlds and is making his own personal like identity about it. Like he's like, I am comfortably both Vietnamese and American and, you know, pseudo European because my wife's French. Like I can live these different worlds and it can all come together into this like beautiful restaurant. So yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't expect to like him as much as I did, but I was like, Oh, he's actually trying to like really see and foster. Cause I do think, you know, they make it not like he's, he sees himself in, in them as well. Cause he also grew up the same way that they did, but he was able to kind of like create his own, you know, version of himself from that. So yeah, I agree. Chef Lay's fun. There were like going back, like there were small cultural touchstones that I really like. And one of the ones that really stood out to me was Bao um, like ordering for his family because like they talk about that the parents, you know, like they, th- they were like professionals in, in their own country, but it, none of that translated to America because they have to like speak English basically. And that's like the one thing that they are all um, like insecure about. So like growing up for me, like in high school, I was the spokesman for my family. I ordered, I talked on the phone, I did everything just because they were like, I don't want to like have to deal with, try to 
have a conversation that deep in, in English. I just don't have the energy for it. And like, for me, I was like, oh my God, like that is such a specific <laughs> problem that I never thought would actually be like expressed in, in a way that I was like reading and, and consuming. So I was like, ugh, thank you, Lone, <laughs> for, for telling our story. <laughs> I love that. So like in any good popsicle, once it gets uh, hot, the popsicle does get tend to get a little sticky. So let's talk about the sticky about the book. I There is a reason why this was the first young adult novel that I read because I did not like going through my anxiety in high school and I really didn't want to relive it again. So that was, I think that was the biggest hurdle for me in getting through the book. Even though the book was a great quick read, like it, I've breezed through it, but I was like, oh, I hated feeling this way when I was in that time. Like, I don't want to have to go through again what it's like to like be anxious about, oh, what if they'll say this? What if they'll say that? Oh my God. <laughs> I hated myself in high school for doing that. See, I, I found relief of like, oh man, thank God I don't have to go through that anymore. There was one specific conversation in the book that I got so angry about, and it just speaks to me as a person. When Chefle and Saffron were talking about their first date, and she was like, he took me to the Eiffel Tower. To Americans, that would be like if some... She was like, to Americans, that would be like if someone took you to Washington, D.C. And I was like, I'm sorry. But that's not what that's like. That's not what it's like. <laughs> it is not. That's not the same thing. I could see if you were like, that's like if you lived in Chicago and someone took you to the bean or something like that. But I was like, <laughs> I don't agree with that comparison. I, I don't know why I took so much issue with it. I think it's just because I love DC so much and was like, why would someone not want to go there? <laughs> I think she should have said like Statue of Liberty because it's like, I have to take a boat. I'm there. I have to buy a ticket. There's mm -hmm. tourists all over the place. I have to climb up. I think that's more of a equal. And then also French. So, you know, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know that was a very small detail and not actually that important, but I still, <laughs> I had to bring it up because I was reading it and I really took issue with it. I would love to go to DC. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody took me to DC on a first date. I'd be like, sign me up. Um, one of the other stickies that I had too was that it did feel like it did feel like the world was all against Lynn. She had so much riding on her. You just said like she. It was almost in a like. It, it kind of goes into like the whole what actually happened to the family and why they hate each other. But it did feel like there was so much on Lynn. Not only was she trying to be like, I want to be an artist, but my family doesn't support that. But also it's like, I have a sister who is actually doing what they want to do. So there's also that layer. And then also she's a girl. So <laughs> like things are already harder for her. So I did feel like Lynn had so much and Bao was just like, yeah, like their his parents didn't have any expectations for him. So honestly, anything he would do would be already better like than what they expected from him. He ended up taking racism as his <laughs> mantle. So I guess it's it does even out. Well, I think because I think at the beginning of the book, it was very his struggle was very much like, what am I passionate about? What what do I want to do with my life? Which is like a very real struggle for high school students, especially. Um, yeah, but I think true. just because it got solved pretty easily that it was like, oh, I want to be a writer. You know what I'm saying? Right so it away. Was like, that was Super his struggle, quick. but it didn't take him that long to solve it. And so then, you know, we have Lynn struggling through up until the very end. And it's like, oh. I know. I felt so bad for her. I mean, I'm glad it all worked out. But yeah, I do agree. Everything that Bao was struggling with did get solved really in the first half of the book not only was he already a great writer he was already like oh the prose the writing the the, the words choice like the the lexicon he was already like a Hemingway yeah. <laughs> by the by half point of the book but also like all of a sudden he was just so charming and debonair and smooth and I was like where did this mm -hmm. come from like all of a sudden he became like Hallmark dreamy which I mean from Lynn's point of view, I bought, but even like from him, sometimes like it would be like, like he would talk about it. I'm like, no, dude, you would not be this smooth. You, you should be the like, 
I, and especially compared to like Veet, his best friend, who is like a track star and like is just like more effortlessly mm-hmm. charming. Yeah. Can we talk about the ending? Let's do it. Let's do it, Allie. Tell me what you think about the ending. It was so abrupt. Yep. Yep. I, it just, it was like, okay, well, we we talked it out, we figured it out, and this is the end now. I just felt like there was no, there was no, like, nice, like, even, like, a chapter of conclusion. It was just like, you're, we're done. It, this is it. Yeah. And I think, too, that there were some things that were lost in that. Like, I found myself wondering, because her applying for the Gold Key Scholarship was such a big part of what she was going through. We didn't find out whether or not she got the scholarship. Mm-hmm. I would have also loved uh, getting Evie's perspective on it, her sister. I felt yeah. like her sister was there and then was gone for the rest of the book. And I think that just in terms of the family dynamic and seeing how she would have reacted to all of it, I think would have been very valuable. And I just wish that it wasn't just like, okay, we've reached the end and that's it. Yeah, I agree. I don't know if that ended up being like, cause I'm, I'm just getting into reading now because of the show. So I don't know, like <laughs> I do want to compare it to other books and see like, is this a normal thing that happens like with editing of like, look, the two already got together. So you just got to wrap up everything else in the plot and then just finish it. Because yeah, I almost wish I had got like another act of like, how do you parse through like going through like years of trauma of this woman who thinks your family was the reason why his brother is dead? (laughs) What? Mm -hmm. That can't just be solved with one discussion. No, that is a lot to unpack no oh a conflict like that would thaw so easily like I totally buy there's no part of me that's like I think that eventually they could get back to a closeness but I just don't believe that it would happen so quickly that they were like no 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 this is what actually happened yeah I was almost like as I was reading the last chapter I was trying to be like wait is this like way in the future because it was already like they're already sharing recipes. They're already talking, you know, the dads are like hanging out. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Are we already like, this is first year of college? Like what's going on? And I was like, oh no, no, no. This like is, this just happened. So I almost wish like, I feel like that like could have been- two days a- later. Yes, exactly. It was so quick that I was like, I almost wish we did see a flash forward because I understand maybe it's not interesting to kind of deal with the, you know, small nudges between- a a broken relationship. I understand that's not exciting. So maybe show us like, what was it like? Yeah. A year after, are they now friends? Are they now doing this or that? Um, So yeah, I agree because I do feel like, ugh, that was so fast that I was like, but you got me so invested in, in how everyone's characters Mm -hmm. kind of like adds a depth to the whole like relationship or the whole like rivalry. So Oh, well, maybe there's a sequel. Who knows? We'll see. (laughs) Let's wrap it up. Overall, um, I feel like this book was a really like breezable read about, you know, honestly, these two like paralleled lives. They are both children um, of the circumstances of like their parents. Like they bonded that over that immediately. Like, what does it mean to be like a restaurant kid? What does it mean to grow up in a restaurant all your life? And they shared a lot of, excuse me they shared a lot of similarities and in a way it was kind of like really nice to kind of like show this like story about kindred spirits falling in love that, you know, that it not only is it like a lovely depiction of like what it's like to be first generation and the life and the culture that that entails, but also, um, you know, just a nice little love story. And I didn't talk about it earlier, but there was a kind of like a sense of community that was also, I didn't expect, but I was like, wow, how timely that like, yeah, there is that sense of ownership of we all in little Saigon are a community, even though I might hate that other restaurant or that we spread gossip around each other. This is still our community that we have to protect. And I I did like that that was Bao's sort of way to unite by by writing an article who knew the power of words Allie. Ugh. 
So beautiful. I love the power of words. I'm curious, did you see did you see yourself in Allie in the book? Um I thought about that. Well, first of all, I always love when there's a character named Allie. I think in in some ways I did, just in the sense that she had a very um strong ownership of who she was and was like, you know, like knew what she not knew what she wanted. I mean, she knew what she wanted, but I think it was just a very, like, I'm going to take charge in this situation, and I know how to move us forward, and this is what we're going to do. Um, and I think that's that's something that I tend to do, of just being like, okay, this is this is the deal with the deal. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> no questions. I just thought it was funny that she was fully, like, a career woman. Yes, I did love that, too. Year. Like she was running the news, the student newspaper, and she was also technically working for the city newspaper. Like she was just. And everywhere. I guess to be fair, I was the editor. <laughs> I was the editor in chief of the yearbook my senior year of high school. So, I was just a, a member of yearbook. I was not editor in chief, but yeah, it's that it's reliving that senior life of like. I am an adult now, but it's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> uh, well, um, as every episode ends, we um, I do create a recipe based on the book. And I had to really think about what type of food I wanted to create for this book because there was such a shortage of it. But <laughs> I decided to share my pho recipe. It's not going to be as good as these two women's pho. I'm telling you that now. But if you are the gal on the go and you have an instant pot and you've got a grocery store where you can buy rotisserie chicken, then you can make the pho. It's so easy. I love making it. I'll be sharing the recipe on the Ampleverse website so you can make it at home too. Anyway, thank you for joining us for this episode of The Popsicle. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and comment below and let us know what you think about this beautiful book, A Fall Love Story. Um, and if you're listening to us on the podcast, make sure you leave us a rating and review. Tell us what you think about the show and what you'd like to hear more in the future. So in five episodes from now, episode number 15, we will be doing our next book, which is What's Mine and Yours by Naima Coster. Allie recommended this one. NPR recommended it to her, I believe. Yes. Allie, go ahead and plug uh, the, your podcast. Oh, well, you can, if you just can't get enough of me, um, I co-host Harry Potter and the Anxious Millennials. Uh, we drop a new episode every Monday where we dive deep into every chapter of the Harry Potter series. Uh, you can also find them on Twitter and Instagram at HB Anxious. And if you have a Twitter, you have to follow at HB Anxious because the power of words <laughs> not only works with Bao, but it also works it in, in the HB Anxious Twitter because it is so powerful. <laughs> it's so funny. So everyone, make sure you follow their Twitter. Thank you so much. <laughs> you can find my my uh, social media at RJ Food Rocks on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and my YouTube channel, RJ Food Rocks, premieres a new video every week. The Popsicle is part of the Ampliverse. Find all of our shows on theampliverse.com. Thank you again for listening. This has been The Popsicle. Bye. The Ampliverse.